Hello and welcome to the DIFF, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's online interactive event series that aims to shift mindsets and inspire action towards the circular economy. We're coming to the end of day one of this one week event, but stay tuned because we've got a really good finale to this Monday evening. My name is Seb and it's my real pleasure to be the host and to have the chance to speak to and ask questions to our two fantastic guests. But you also have that chance. This is very much an interactive event and we want your questions, we want your comments. And there are a couple of places that you can push those. You can post them um, on the thinkdiff.co webpage in the comments section that's there. Or if you've already navigated your way to the YouTube stream, just post them in the comments feature there. Um, so today we're talking about food, food production. We're talking about agriculture talk about soil um, and actually there's startling statistics that come out about that as we only have 60 years left of topsoil which of course as we're going to find out in this session is crucial to uh, our future. Um, so what are we going to do about it? Well today I'm joined by two people who can give us some inspiration, some information and some hope in that regard. I'm joined by Felipe who's the founder of an organization called Renature um, that helps farmers to switch to something called agroforestry. And I'm also joined by Patrick Worms, who is an academic and researcher and expert on that same topic. Um, so I guess actually, Patrick, the first question to ask, the obvious question to ask, is what is agroforestry? Well, it's quite simple. Agroforestry is a system where trees work for their living. So the idea that a tree is something that grows in a forest and that you leave alone until you fell it in order to gain its timber, it's completely contrary to the vast majority of human agricultural experience. Across the world, fields are filled with trees. In fact, we've done work using remote sensing imagery that shows that <clears throat> on over 40% of the world's agricultural surface area, at least 10% tree cover is out there. And the reason for that is very simple. Those trees provide useful services to farmers during their lives, not just when they're dead. They provide things like erosion control. Their deep roots suck up nutrients that crops cannot reach and those nutrients fall back onto the soil surface through leaf fall and twitter fall. They slow down wind, which means they slow down evapotranspiration, which means they create a microclimate, which means that crop plants and animals are better able to suggest heat waves or even small droughts. And they generate soil. They generate a massive amount of soil simply because of the way that through photosynthesis they capture so much atmospheric carbon and put it down deep into the ground as soil, what's known technically as soil organic carbon. So it's, it, it, it's the perfect Brexit machine, if you like. You can have your cake and you can eat it when you add trees to your agricultural fields. So agroforestry is the art of, I mean, I suppose, well, so let me reframe that question because in some ways, uh, what we're insinuating or not saying at the moment or in that introduction is that a lot of mainstream agricultural methods quite deliberately design trees out of the system. Is that a fair statement to make? That is absolutely a fair statement to make. Um, we fell in love. We, are just, we humans are like toddlers. And about 70 years ago, we fell in love with the new toys we got for Christmas. And those toys were inorganic fertilizers, there were pesticides, there were herbicides, there were tractors, diesel, all these machines that mean that you can sit in a chair and press a button as opposed to being down on your knees looking at what a plant is doing. And these toys were wonderful, just like every toy at Christmas is wonderful. They did manage to massively increase productivity over the short period. They did manage to feed a growing world population over a short period. And it's only in the last decades that the majority has begun to realize that this, this productivity comes with a serious problem with massive emissions of soil carbon back into the atmosphere with a widespread destruction of biodiversity around the world and in the end with a farming system that is becoming less and less sustainable even financially because the only way you can continue farming once you've nuked your soils with all these chemicals over decades is by putting more and more and more chemicals on and they of course cost money so most farmers are operating right at the bread line uh, they know that they're on a road to perdition doing this. And that's why the message that you can do something else, that you can start working with trees and with animals to improve your soils and improve your productivity is beginning to resonate so well with people who are farming every day. 
That's that's perfectly said, uh, Patrick. And also, like, uh, if we go back in time, even before we humans arrive on this planet, you know, in nature, uh, following the natural succession, uh, no life would evolve. Like, so there was only bare rocks in the in the landscapes. And as soon as we start reaching the climax zone, where is the burned zone? Is the forest ecosystem? Uh, when we arrive here, we have many wars, and then we had, after the Second World War, we had a green revolution where we start uh, separating ourselves from the forest and taking them down to grow one single crop uh, in order to feed uh, humanity. But we didn't clearly understood the knowledge and the science behind nature by then. And now we are finally understanding and, and uh, there's a lot of businesses which is actually running out of the production because of the, the way they're growing their major uh, crops. For instance, cacao and coffee. They're, they're, those are two crops that they really need shade. Uh, and they are not being shaded due to the due the to their traditional way of growing, which is not uh, which is not giving enough uh, using the natural succession to to succeed in the in the process. And I mean, it was interesting you mentioned that Felipe. Um, I mean, obviously, there's there's something about in nature naturally i mean this is obviously a concept that's very much inspired by looking at how natural systems work which is a topic and idea that's very much pervasive through much of circular economy thinking as well um obviously in nature forests kind of naturally occur woodlands naturally occur in different environments and they have different functions different environments it seems obviously it seems to me that agriculture agroforestry in some way it sort of implies that you're somehow harnessing that quite deliberately versus just allowing it to happen. Is that true? Or is that, is it actually much simpler than that? Absolutely. Agroforestry is about harnessing natural processes, ecosystemic processes for your own ends. <clears throat> so the easiest way to think about this is uh, that if you're a farmer, you need tools, right? And one set of tools is mechanization. And that can go from the hand hoe that's been used for thousands of years to the latest uh, drone control tractors. Another set of tools you need is genetics. Uh, you need the, the better livestock varieties, better crop varieties. And again, this is something that's been going on for thousands of years, right? We are not farming wild plants. We are farming domesticated plants. We are not farming wild animals. We're farming domesticated animals. So that's the second set of things you need. The third set of things you need is fertility. And that can be manure, it can be an organic fertilizer, it can be tea compost, it can be compost teas, it can be all sorts of things that are adding fertility to the soil. But that still leaves you with a huge amount of stuff that you can either pay expensive diesel to get or that you can let nature do for you. That's the fourth set of tools, the ecological tools, erosion control tools, moisture control tools, rain percolation tools, fertility tools, and all of those can be provided by the clever use of trees in fields or pastures. So just to get a little bit practical on that point, so we understand it, you know, maybe try and understand it is in, in nuanced version of what, what you would say to a, mo a modern farmer, maybe someone who's growing a particular crop on the land is, is something along the lines of plant more trees on your land. I mean, is it as simple as that? Uh, let me <laughs> let me let me let me try now, Patrick. Uh, that is, so, in fact, what your organization, I guess, does, Felipe Renature Foundation. It works with farmers who are exactly going through that process. How do we actually adopt this? Yeah, no, literally, like, like now at the moment, uh, our team is planting a uh, white pepper for a Dutch company called uh, Verstehen in Indonesia. Uh, and the interesting thing in our design for the regenerative ag agroforestry is that we always take three components into consideration. One is the economic resilience of the design. And the economic species is the cash crop of the design. So in this case, is the, is the white pepper. Uh, two is the food security species, uh, which is the crops that farmers, they can, they can co-create uh, by choosing which uh, fruits and vegetables they would like to eat from their own land. So they can also ensure food security for the farmers, but also fuel the ownership of the farmer to manage that farm in the long term. Uh, so in the rows of the, uh, the, the species that they choose, they can eat from in the, in the, in the future. And three is the, is the biomass species, the ones that will replace fertilizer use. So for instance, we plant a lot of eucalyptus or either bananas and either in the temperate climate, we plant willows. So it really depends, but the biomass species are the ones that replace fertilizer use. So you prune them and you use the trees 
as a, as a source of biomass. So these three components shows the farmers in a way that they can also benefit in long-term prosperity for their uh, economic resilience. So they can have also uh, food security elements, but also have timber, for instance, so they can have a long, uh, they can sell in uh, over the years. So we show how much revenue each each crop that they chose uh, have, and then they and they can have a, a more uh, also inspiration to keep uh, farming. For instance, like I received last week a picture from a farmer in Kyrgyzstan, where we planted like uh, carrots with him, uh, and uh, he sent a picture of his cute children selling the carrot in the in this organic local market and saying like uh, you know because of these carrots you guys came and planted together with us my kid is not moving to the city anymore he wants to stay and, and keep farming so this kind of impact inspirational impact is hidden before before uh, behind agroforestry and regenerative agriculture which is uh, fascinating to see like how farmers they get motivated to to shift yeah, Felipe, that's absolutely right. You know, and, and what's fascinating about agroforestry is how it has these beneficial events, effects at almost any scale. Um, your, your, your farmer in Kyrgyzstan uh, is a small farmer from the way you talk about him. And I've worked with farmers in Rwanda who typically operate on, on about an acre of land and who manage to, who have to feed their families from an acre of land. And agroforestry can help in those situations. I'm also talking to very large land managers, banks, that are managing in the aggregate territories that are the thousands, tens, thousands at least of square kilometers big. And they too are interested in adding trees to their systems because of the financial benefits that come from buffering the impacts of weather events and from having timber to sell and from needing less fertilizer and from needing less diesel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Probably the most exciting thing that I'm seeing happening in this space, and I don't know if you agree, Felipe, is the birth of consultancies that are making money from telling farmers how to do agroforestry. And I, I'd like to give a special short, a shout out here to Agrouf in France, that was the first in Europe to do so, to propagate ventures in the US, which is doing so successfully in the US. And of course, there's many examples in Brazil as well, aren't there? Exactly, exactly. There is a lot of like new initiative, like uh, in, there's a lot of demand actually, like we have been receiving like uh, projects all over the world, like from China to Hawaii. And uh, so there's a lot of room for experts in this field to start guiding and helping supporting the, the corporations also to transition. Uh, and then we can connect the, the smallholder farmers and local communities that are working in this field for a long time. And then with the, the corporate uh, in, in initiatives like that wants to transition and they need this guidance. So I think there's a couple of interesting uh, examples like uh, with Lush, for instance, and Nespresso and uh, other brands like Guayaki, which is working with Yerba Mate, with indigenous people in Brazil, with Agroforestry, which is fascinating to see that there is like, uh, you know, brands like this, which are really getting involved and, and investing this transition to regenerative agriculture. And of course, there are challenges in, in agroforestry, for instance, like uh, with uh, uh, mechanization and for scalability. Uh, so we are still working on getting contact with uh, universities and, uh, and uh, technology uh, institutions so that we can start optimizing the processes to harvest, to prune, to manage these uh, this agroforestry farms. Uh, so there is a few challenges ahead, of course, for scale. Uh, but I'm sure, like Patrick, is uh, also working on it from the, with the World Labour Forces Center and the, and the whole team. Yeah, I mean, and, and I'm, I'm happy to report that the, the work that we're doing, um, both on the tropical front and on the temperate front, shows that it is completely possible to run a highly efficient mechanized farming system using agroforestry. The difficulty is that the farmer needs a new set of skills, which he doesn't necessarily have. And that's how to care for a tree, how to prune a tree how to plan his system. Um, and the difficulty we have there is that, at least in Europe, Felipe, we, we, are, we are blocked from spreading more quickly, uh, as it were, because agroforestry advice does not yet have a proper business model. Consider the following situation. Let's suppose I'm Syngenta or Yara or Monsanto, and you are a farmer. Every year, I'm going to sell you my drugs. I'm going to sell you my seeds the fertilizer that goes with it and the phytosanitation that goes with it. It will work, but you're gonna be forced to come back next year and buy it again, and the year after that and buy it again, and the year after that and buy it again. And altogether, I'm going to be making somewhere between 100 and 200 euros a year from each hectare of your land, simply by selling you my dope. 
right? That gives you massive market power. I can, since I'm doing that with practically every farm in Europe. So I suddenly have billions of euros that I can spend on marketing, on research and development, and on lobbying to protect my markets, right? Uh -huh. whereas, whereas you or me as an agroforester, we turn up in a farming landscape in which there are no trees left, in which nobody remembers that four generations ago, it was full of trees, but they were all cut down. And in which people think, farmers think, a good field is a clean field without anything on it. And then you have to find one farmer in that group that is willing not only to consider the idea of agroforestry, but that pays you a consultancy fee. It's a rare beast. So let, but even so, let's suppose you find it. So you find this one farmer and he'll pay you a consultancy fee, maybe 500 euros or 1,000 euros for your trouble. So instead of making let's suppose you have 200 hectares, instead of making 20,000 euros a year, every single year from your farm, Felipe, because I sell you drugs, instead of that, I'm going to be making maybe 500 euros or 1,000 euros once from your farm. Therefore, there just is no business. And that's why you don't see advertising um, for agroforestry, but you see advertising for fertilizers. That's why when you go to the big agricultural conferences, it's filled with people selling chemicals and machinery. Exactly. And there's very few people that are talking about agroforestry. The bottom line is, and that's the fundamental problem we have here, is trees don't lobby, tractors do. How do we get out of that problem? Exactly. And also, Patrick, like the biggest input in the conventional agriculture uh, it is the, the, the agrochemicals and the biggest... No, the biggest input in conventional agriculture is propaganda. Look at the word you use here. You called it conventional agriculture. It's not. It's industrial agriculture. It's brand new. It's only existed for three generations or so. Before that, it didn't exist anywhere on the planet. There is nothing conventional about it. But they have convinced us to call it conventional agriculture or even worse traditional agriculture <laughs> there is nothing traditional or conventional about this right and this is the first victory of that industry they have managed to control the vocabulary we use so i would suggest that from now on these kind of agriculture we call industrial agriculture because mm. that's all it is it's applying the methods of industry to the landscape and that's why it's failing as well because landscapes are living things they are not inert things like a factory floor no perfect uh, this perfect. conversation so about language is so interesting to me because ultimately the way we think and the words we use shape how we see the world around us and so absolutely you know when you as patrick kind of says i guess when you say it's conventional then it's somehow you're doing something disruptive or maybe dangerous or risky by doing something that sits outside of of that exactly conventional um, sounds good right it's conservative it's it's cozy we sit the other thing the i picked, picked up on your conversation is this notion and i found it very interesting that you moved to this conversation of consultancies because it seems to me that uh, as you described it that industrial farming practices it's kind of like a, it's like a prescription model you you need this much land you have this many inputs you have this yield out and obviously there are negative impacts now that are becoming more the more widely known i suppose like decreasing yields and land degradation and the runoffs from chemicals into our water streams and environments so those things becoming that the, the effects of that are becoming better known it seems like in the world of agroforestry, what you're actually providing is knowledge and information. You know, that what you were talking about, Felipe, is that in a different context, the solution, you know, might be the same kind of principles and tools, but it can actually be quite different as well. Like it requires the local knowledge and context of that particular farmer and what they're what their crop and, and, their, and where they are, whether it's temperate tropical climate, for example. Um, so that's the challenge, I suppose. No, indeed, like for sure, uh, as Patrick was saying, like uh, in the industrial agriculture is re pretty much based, is an input based agriculture, as, as agroforestry and regenerative agriculture is a knowledge based agriculture, which requires more, yeah, consultancy and more knowledge transfer, which uh, the willingness to pay is much lower. Uh, and that's because of the lack of uh, awareness of the topic. But uh, the interesting thing now is that we are seeing how to work in a different uh, financial, using financial instruments to start ad allocating capital to uh, foster transitioning to regenerative agriculture and agroforestry. So we're talking to several uh, impact investors and, uh, and also like angel investors uh, and uh, corporations that are willing to transition and, in and invest in this, in this transition that for us to, to start helping farmers instead of uh, uh, expecting from them to put investment to for us to accelerate this process 
to work with this blended finance instrument. So the impact investor can put half of the investment and corporation can put the other half. And then we can start moving towards a, a transition package. So instead of selling like a, a, this a industrialized package with a, a certain amounts of pesticides, fertilizers, you have the agroforestry regenerative package, which you start selling the knowledge, but also like how much uh, tr cost is involved for the farmer to do the transition. Because there is a transition phase uh, to, to the systems. And uh, that's how I think uh, you can show. And, and I think Patrick has some nice pictures that he can show now. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Am I sharing a screen or am I not sharing a screen? Patrick, I can confirm that you are sharing a screen. Right. In that case, um, what I wanted to do is just to rapidly show not only how widespread agroforestry is, you can see it here, um, the top left is in France, the top right is in Niger, in uh, the African Sahel, the bottom left is Europe's biggest agroforestry system in the high north and it circles the North Pole, the bottom right is a system in, in Uganda, and also how ancient these systems are. Um, when you look at this, this is a, a vignette of a, one of the many villas that the Medici family in uh, Renaissance Italy had. And what you can see is a working farm, and it's an agroforestry farm. You can see that the land has been plowed in between these trees, which are, of course, fruit trees that's been optimized for productivity. You have examples all over the world. Here is an example that comes from Nicaragua, where you have timber trees growing in a coffee plantation. Here is an example that you see whenever you fly over southern Russia, these long windbreaks that were planted to protect the cereal fields from the winds of the steppes. Here is that example from Uganda again, from Europe. Here is an example from Brazil, Felipe. This is an oil palm plantation that we are running, um, an agroforestry oil palm plantation, and it is, of course, a lot more complicated than pure oil. Its oil productivity alone is almost twice as high as that of a monocrop field. And of course, it has a lot more biodiversity and needs far fewer chemicals. So this kind of thing, what you see here is the future. Look at this picture. It's wheat and you are harvesting it. If there were no trees there, you would be in a situation where there is no photosynthesis in late summer, uh, in early summer in Europe. 16 hours of sunlight wasted. All that rain, and it rains in Europe in the summer, wasted. At least with those trees, Biological activity is continuing, photosynthesis is continuing, biomass is being created, carbon is being locked into the soil, even as you harvest your winter crop. Sometimes it can be, agroforestry can take really funny forms. I love this picture because the crop is the big bits in the picture and the agroforestry component is a small bit in the picture. The crops, of course, are the coconuts and the small bits are trees called glyricidia, which have the ability to fix nitrogen from the air and uh, whose leaves are simply mixed into the ground to fertilize the coconuts. So these systems are absolutely universal. You see them everywhere in the world and they are historical. People were proud of them. People were had painters paint their agroforestry systems like this 18th example, uh, 18th century example from Italy or this uh, 18th century example from England or this illustration from a how-to book from Germany from the 1850s or this picture taken in the 1930s of a French landscape. Trees were everywhere. And the reason for that is they work so well. So what we need to do now is figure out how we can get back to that, because those trees are the ones that are going to save us. And I'm trying to get out of share. Stop share. Here you go. <laughs> that's perfect. Um, well, I was, that's, fantastic. that's really helpful perspective. Thank you, Patrick. I'm kind of interested in the business side of this, because whenever we talk about, and it's very similar across a number of regenerative agricultural techniques and conversations, it's almost true in every example that you've shared high yields, better results, um, consequently, surely more. And, and, and actually, you also, you've also mentioned the fact that you have more products that you can sell because you've created diversity. Consequently, surely there's money to be made in this approach. Felipe, you mentioned a bit about there's a challenge in scaling. Um, maybe we can talk about that a bit more. But I, I, I wonder how much interest you have from some larger organizations in these techniques, because surely where there's money to be made, the, the, there are businesses who are going to be interested. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, so, like, if you think about like uh, uh, transition, uh, with the willingness to transition and to pay from uh, from either investors and 
from corporations to, to, to scale that and, to, and incorporate that into their whole uh, production areas. Uh, it really comes out from uh, the, the necessity to change. For instance, like now, mostly ch chocolate and coffee companies, they're realizing the decrease on production of their major uh, crops. So they feel the urgency to start changing the, the way they're, they're doing agriculture. For example, Brazil, in Minas Gerais, the coffee production is decreasing dramatically. It's all becoming an like island of monoculture coffee, which is, has a lot of diseases. And now there's an agroforestry that I want to share the screen with you guys to show uh, what are we doing there. Uh, so this is a model farm we are doing in Minas Gerais uh, region. Uh, and it shows uh, smoothly like what we're planting. So the, it's, it's, it's in the middle of the valley, like where it has been mostly monoculture coffee. And we're planting a diversified system with uh, coffee as a major cash crop. African mahogany as a timber uh, generation and biomass, macadamia as you can ha harvest as well and have a it has a high value in the market, and peanut uh, and bananas to shade the coffee in the beginning. And, and you can see this video here. It shows like uh, uh, the farmer we we're working with. He chose to be in the top of the valley, so that uh, all the neighbors who are planting monoculture coffee they can see clearly how inspired they can get from the agroforestry in the top of the hill, uh, which, is, which is very interesting because uh, uh, now by showing the results of the farm, uh, the neighbors are really much uh, transitioning because of this, this system that it's being uh, exposed to them from their own houses and, and from their own farms. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and there and, and, something really important, Felipe. Um, the neighbors are seeing it and are inspired. No. And this, um, uh, um, Seb, you asked us, what was the fundamental business driver? It's examples. If you're in a landscape where nobody's doing agroforestry, being the first one to do it is going to be really hard. But if you're in a landscape where you can see somebody making money from it, you're going to adopt it yourself. And the kind of work that Philippe is doing in that farm is, is exactly that. The farmer is willing to put his farm in a place where everybody can see it, and he's going to make sure that his neighbors see his success. And that's exactly what this needs. Exactly. We need a lot of showcase. And this one is mechanized. So it shows that it's, it can be done in scale uh, with machines as well. Uh, so it's, it's very amazing because it's all mechanized coffee there. So, and here you can see, like, you know, it's influencing in the water, uh, yeah, keeping the moisture below soil uh, because of the crops we grow in beneath the, the coffee. And it's also increasing biodiversity. The, those, those are bees pollinating the coffee, like uh, before even the, the harvest of the coffee. And uh, here you can see the oasis of the monoculture coffee production. And there's some uh, natural fertilizer using the tree, the banana trees as, as to feed the, the coffee uh, plants. And here you can see also the machines giving enough uh, wood chips so they can use the timber to generate biomass. And then, then they can uh, provide the coffee plants with enough uh, wood chips to, to keep humidity in the soil and nutrients. So this is the soil regeneration process, the difference between soil and now getting back to the economic perspective. So can you just, sorry, can you go back to that last picture, uh, Felipe? Yeah. So to clarify um, with those two soil examples, you've, you're showing there one example of, of, well, you're showing some soil that's been farmed agroforestry and that is the soil on the right. Yeah, uh, they are both the same uh, location soil. Uh, the first, the hand, the hand, the, the full hand in the left, it's actually uh, seven months before the right hand in the in the right. So you can uh, see on the right, it's got a deeper color. It looks kind of right, and, less and dry. <laughs> right, and what that, what that is, it's uh, organic matter. It's organic matter that's yeah. begun to be incorporated in a soil that, judging by uh, 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 the picture is, most, is very sandy. Um, and so what that's going to do is all sorts of wonderful things. First, it's going to provide nutrition to all the mycorrhizae and the arthropods and the billions of bacteria that live in the soil. 
and that collaborate with plants to make plants grow, right? That's been the big finding of uh, soil science in the last couple of years, is how active the soil is, how alive it actually is. It is alive. And because it is alive, it needs to be fed and its food is soil organic matter. So there's that. The second thing that that does is it creates lots and lots of little pockets in the soil, which means exactly. that when the rain comes, when the rain comes, it percolates into the soil and recharges the groundwater instead of rushing off to the valley and turning into a flood and destroying a city downstream, right? Um, so just by doing that very simple thing of adding some trees to your land, you are kickstarting the biological activity that suddenly gives you all sorts of benefits from drawing carbon down in the soil where it can do a lot more good than it does in the atmosphere to uh, buffering extreme weather events such as floods. It's, it's, it's just, it's fantastic. Exactly, exactly. And, and it's very fascinating like, to see that you know, like, uh, soil is, is key for long-term economic resilience. So like, uh, for sure. And then the next slide is shows like, the, rev, uh, the, the full potential growth uh, harvest of each uh, crop that it's, it's, uh, it's integrated into design. And then how many years it takes to give the production. And then here it shows how much revenues each crop that we are designing uh, can potentially give for the conventional. And uh, I'm not going to show the full business plan, but it basically it says that it's actually twice, almost twice as profitable as the conventional. And that that's not only because of the yield that the coffee gives, but also because of the, the harvest of the bananas, the macadamia, and the African mahogany as a timber to, to give enough profit for the farmer as, as aside from the coffee. So, yeah. And, and what you see here um, is... A perfect example, and that's also perfect in institutional terms, because the farmer owns his land and owns his trees. He can decide what to plant and when to cut it. In very many parts of the world, Seb, the problem is that farmers do not have tenure over their trees. I spoke to a fantastic farmer in Senegal, in the Sahel, who was so upset he was thinking of cutting down his trees because in the dry season, thieves come and cut down the trees to get at the leaves to feed their animals. I have spoken to places in Rwanda and in Kenya where thieves come and steal the trees in the night. I have been to Côte d'Ivoire where the law says that in a former forest area, if you're a cocoa farmer and you plant a tree, it's yours. But if the tree naturally regenerates from seed from one of the trees that was there before, it doesn't belong to you, but belongs to the forestry department. That can come and cut down, in effect, steal a giant tree worth tens of thousands of euros destroying your field in the process without needing to compensate you. That's the law in Côte d'Ivoire, right? So any farmer, as soon as he sees um, a seedling sprout from a forest species, is just going to get rid of it because it's trouble. But he is instead going to plant exotics like mangoes and, uh, uh, and papayas and so on. And, and one thing that this leads to, and that's scary, is a uniformization of landscapes around the world. Yeah. In Brazil, in Africa, in Asia, it's always the same trees, the same plants. It's eucalyptus, it's grevillea, it's melia, it's mango, it's papaya, it's banana, it's coffee, it's cacao. There's a small group of trees that are taking over tropical landscapes, just the same process as we see here in Europe. And the, the thing that scares me the most about that is how limited our food options are. No matter where you go in the world, we eat carrots, we eat tomatoes, we eat onions, we eat wheat, we eat rice, we eat maize. We need like 10, 12 things that you find in every diet, right? And agroforestry is also a way of encouraging farmers to broaden their production outside of this very small area of, uh, of, of well-known plants, simply because it's, agroforestry is almost a gateway drug to regenerative agriculture. Once a farmer gets started with agroforestry, he or she usually becomes really interested in soil and wants to try new things and becomes more of a scientist and an experimenter than just a farmer. And that can lead to very, very rapid progress. It's, um, we have got some really great questions coming in now um, from the online audience, which I will um, get to. And actually one of them seems to speak a little bit to this geographical, that seems to touch on this sort of geographical point that's, that you both Kind of mentioned at different times it's from someone called scarlet she asks is this uh something that has more success in certain regions and countries where farming is more distributed like india or is it something where it's actually useful for there to be a smaller number of players where, where's the greatest level of buy-in i guess that question speaking to well if, if i may felipe yeah. um the, the biggest successes are in places like niger 
one of the poorest countries on earth, where about 10 million hectares of land have been regreened using agroforestry, in their case, something called farm and managed natural regeneration, <clears throat> simply because without the trees, you can't farm. Without trees, it's too hot, the rainy season is too short, um, your, your crops don't have time to mature, and half the time you go hungry, right? You see the same thing in Malawi. In the north of Malawi, where population densities are lower, crops are, uh, um, the maize is grown as a monocrop. In the south of Malawi, where the population density is higher, people have put the trees in there, mostly pigeon peas and phytoherbia, because they're legumes, they feed the soil. That means they don't have to spend so much money on fertilizer. Without trees, you can't feed those families. India is an interesting case because it's not really a poor country anymore. It's a middle income country, but it is also the first country in the world to have launched a national agroforestry strategy. And it was not launched by the Minister of Agriculture or the Minister of Environment. Minister it was launched by the President of India um, in 2014. And as a result of that, India and its states are in the process of spending billions of dollars a year to encourage farmers to adopt agroforestry. And it's spreading rapidly and at very large scale across that country. It's a really, really encouraging story there. Yeah, no, indeed. And uh, I would like also to add to that, like that the principle of agroforestry is, uh, it can be done any, in any kind of climate and any kind of, uh, kind of country. And uh, like there are multiple examples done, being done in Mediterranean, in the tropical, in the temperate. Uh, and then, uh, so there's a lot of like uh, examples being done and it needs much more than we actually, actually have at the moment. Uh, but for sure, it's 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 uh, it's good to have a proof of concept for each kind of climate, so that you can also show like and inspire like businesses and industries to start transitioning. So now we're working on uh, developing uh, uh, seven model farms worldwide, which can become a proof of concept for multiple commodities. So if you look into palm oil, soybean, cattle, soy uh, cacao, coffee, cotton, and rubber. And these ones are the ones that we are now looking to. How can we uh, create these models throughout these different uh, uh, contexts of, cl of climate? So in order for us to successfully, you know, share the story, the successful uh, economic resilience of these cases, so that we can uh, really, uh, yeah, have a solution for the local context to transition. We've got about five minutes left and a handful of questions left in the audience. So I'm going to do my best to get through these for our online viewers. Thank you so much for these questions. It's really what makes these sessions rich and I'm sure it's uh, what Patrick and Felipe will enjoy most about this session is your questions versus mine. But um, question from Simone, which I think speaks a little bit to this question around business. She asks, who's in and who's out? Um, we kind of mentioned a little bit around, I guess some of the um, big industrial players like Monsanto and those, those companies were, were mentioned. We talked a little bit about some of the businesses who are maybe interested in it. Is there a broad picture of the winners and losers if we move towards agroforestry versus industrial farming? I don't like talking in terms of winners and losers uh, for two reasons. First, agroforestry is not a magic bullet. You are still going to need to farm. You can't just plant your trees and then relax with a beer, right? It still demands work. And that means you will see- a shame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a shame, but so it is. So you'll still need tools. Um, you will need fewer tools. The, 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 the comment that comes back again and again and again when you talk to mechanized farmers that have switched over to these systems is, God, my, my diesel bills have gone down. My input bills have gone down. I may not have a higher yield, but I'm simply making more money because my costs are dropping. And later on, of course, they're starting to make a higher yield, so they're even happier. Um, but <clears throat> if we try to position it as something that is against industrial agriculture, we're going to lose simply because remember the industrial ag guys are making 200 euros per hectare per year from almost every single bloody farm on the universe, and we are not. Um, so we can't do that. Um, that. That's a tactical move, but there's also a strategic move. The people who work for Monsanto don't wake up in the morning and say, gee, I'm going to go and fuck up the planet today. They go and work on what they believe are useful solutions. Now we can differ on as reasonable as gentlemen, as reasonable or as ladies and gentlemen, I should say, uh, about the importance of their solutions versus own solutions. And you can have productive debates about that. But starting off from a position of we against them is not going to be useful. Another point I wanted to make, you're asking where the biggest players could be. And if I may be allowed, 
Let me just show you one more picture, if I can do that. There we go. What you see here is a picture that was taken uh, at the edge of the Sahara in Niger. And the little plants that you see in the sand are millet. And as you can tell, it was a dry year and that millet just didn't grow, right? Now look to the left of the picture. You see all these berries in that tree? They grew just fine. And they are absolutely delicious if you know how to detoxify them. These were foods that were grown locally and were eaten by people until the colonization, but first by the Arabs, then by the Europeans, um, where the culture changed and these foods were decreed to be only fit for animals. But that's the solution right there, is to stop trying to grow inappropriate crops in environments that don't suit it, like the millet here, and to start exploiting what the local nature is desperately trying to show you it can produce, right? And that too is something that uh, goes against the grain of what many farmers have been taught because what they have been taught is in effect total control. Take a piece of land, get rid of everything on that piece of land and replace it with your plant, your inputs, your chemicals, your design system, your management system. And anything external that comes in is usually a pest that needs to be destroyed, right? So you need to start thinking differently as well. And the, the, the way that you described it, Raphael, these, these successional agroforestry systems, they are so powerful because you are not just thinking differently in terms of space, here are my trees, here are my crops, but also in terms of time, because today I'm making most of my money from vegetables. Then as the trees grow, I'm gonna make most of my money from fruits, right? So suddenly it's like playing multidimensional chess. I love it and the farmers who do it and are good at it love it as well. In terms of, uh, we've got another great question from Clem, which is, um, you know, there's going to be 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. Land is, land is an issue, the amount of land we have. Their question is, how does this play out in terms of land? Is agroforestry something that requires more land, less land? Is there a question about, you know, the amount of land we need to grow enough food to feed everyone? Well, by definition, it requires less land since it's more productive. You, you know, instead of needing, producing, needing two hectares to produce one ton of X, you suddenly only need one hectare to produce one ton of X. And, and let, me, um, let me quickly add to that, like, uh, that's a very good question. I mean, like land availability for, for the, the, the rise of consumption, like with the increase of population. Uh, yeah, like it's, it's, uh, it's we, now in Renature, we're working on diversifying uh, agricultural landscapes in order to benefit multiple stakeholders. So what do I mean by that? Like if, if, uh, if, uh, if a local uh, business requires to have like some cacao and there is another company that needs uh, palm oil, uh, why not give both uh, companies the, uh, their major cash crop into the same landscape? So we're going to start shading the cacao that goes to a chocolate company and then cross-sector design with a palm oil, giving shade to the cacao that goes to aromatics industry. So, and then you, these both cash crops uh, can, you can diversify your landscape by benefiting those two companies and also farmers from feeding, like from the fruits and from the nuts and from the vegetables that you can grow in it. So, uh, and then you can work with the 17th SDG that it's partnership for the goals. So to show how corporations, they can actually benefit from the major commodity into the same landscape. landscape. And then you, by diversifying these landscapes, you can make much more efficient use of land for sourcing like uh, these crops and then and, and making a more uh, long-term uh, viable systems for for production in the in the for for in order for us to have enough for this for the 10 billion people coming. So it's like two farms in one, the way you describe that. Oh, the, um, the best the best ones are like 20 farms in one. <laughs> yeah, um, and very very good showcase that uh, Patrick showed with the palm oil because in Brazil because it's exactly this. It's a very good case like. Uh, that the, the world of forestry is involved with the palm oil giving shade to the cacao and they sourcing two different companies. And, uh, and, and you can really see like, okay, agroforestry is benefiting multiple uh, stakeholders, not only the farmers, but also two different companies or also like the, the whole ecosystem services and, uh, and this kind of landscape and management, uh, it, it's, it's very powerful to, to inspire new businesses to, to cooperate instead of having this monoculture uh, exclusive kind of designs they have today.
Yeah, and, and, and they love it because their costs go down as they start moving over to these agroforestry systems. Question in from Freya, which I think is touches on a sort of macro topic that seems related to it. She's reflecting a bit on in her comment around the sort of fact the mass extinction event we're facing. Her question is, um, how, how does, does agroforestry have some role to play in increasing biodiversity, you know, globally? Is, is it a, a way of engineering a re reverse? Yes. How much time do I have? How many science papers can I throw at you to prove that this is happening? It, <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, it doesn't matter where you look at it. Uh, it's been looked at in the Arctic. It's been looked at in humid tropics, in dry tropics, in temperate systems, in the Americas, in Europe, in Africa. And the, the, the reply is always the same. Your biodiversity goes right up. It, in the most complex systems, like these really complex Damar gardens in Sumatra or some of these uh, uh, oil palm cacao systems in Brazil, your biodiversity goes back to 60, 70 percent of what it was like before humans intervened. Whereas in a, in a monocrop plantation of uh, palm oil, your biodiversity is at 2% level of what it used to be, right? So it goes back. No, it's not a natural forest anymore. No, it's not as biodiverse as a natural forest. It's not a solution instead of rewilding. But it goes back from the disaster that industrial agriculture is to something that is sustainable over the long term because it's got that resilience built in. And that resilience comes in large part because of that higher biodiversity in the system, right? Because you've got far more... Uh, predators that are eating your pests and you've got birds in there and mammals and amphibians and everybody is living their little life together and they, while living their little life together they just provide you with the ecosystem services that you as a farmer need yeah no and and, and also adding to that uh, i would like to just show this uh, slide here quickly uh, which shows uh, in holland uh, an agroforestry design uh, next to uh, in, in, in a monoculture field and also a nature reserve and what is amazing that shows like that the agroforestry uh, proves to actually have uh, twice as much uh, biodiversity than in a uh, uh, 40 years old nature reserve. And agroforestry only has eight years old and has twice as much biodiversity and then in a nature reserve, like a secondary forest men planted that didn't know much what to plant in there. And then if you compare it to a conventional farm, the amount of worms, earthworms, so that you can really increase soil fertility it shows to be like 87% individuals as convention is 66 and nature reserve is 36. And you have a total warm uh, biomass uh, that it's much higher, which means that you, if you have an, a fat earthworm, then you can actually allow the, the soil to open more space for uh, nutrient cycling and water resilience. Uh, and this is much more effective. Like, so in, in, for sure, like biodiversity in, in, in agroforestry systems seems to be it proves to be like much more higher than a, even in a secondary forest or in a conventional farm we've we've yeah. run out of time unfortunately but okay. uh, there is one more question that i think is very would provide a lot of value for our audience and so i guess you'll i have to ask you to answer it in about 30 seconds or so but where does someone start uh, you mean where does a farmer start yes where if you're a farmer watching this or someone involved in some way in the industry what, what do you, what, where can you go to get? Go to YouTube and look at the examples, the films that are on there of farmers who've done it already and are only too happy to speak about what they've done. That will get you inspired. The next thing you do is uh, call up whoever your local agroforesters are. It's easy enough in Europe. It's easy enough to find out. You go to the website of EURAF, the European Agroforestry Federation, and you're going to have listings for all of the countries. And that way you'll get in touch with people who can become your advisors. Um, and with those advisors, uh, you'll be able to plan your system, to design it, to plant the right trees or regenerate the right trees in the right place. And uh, well, for me, like uh, I think thinking the different like uh, people, like I think uh, consumers for sure start buying things which can be, uh, perhaps come from an agroforestry or regenerative agriculture farm. Uh, if, if, if you're an impact investor, you know, start looking to the investment opportunity cases that there is in agroforestry. Uh, if you are like a corporate, like start thinking about your long-term crop uh, production. If you want to have a, if you, you still want to have like a, the, the production and uh, as a farmer, uh, yeah, like uh, really like get inspired by the, the regional like uh, showcase that could be potentially be in, uh, in your region because there is multiple forces uh, around there in the world at the moment. And uh, yeah, so I think is uh, we have a lot of role to play in different uh, uh, in different groups, target groups. And uh, thank you so much for all of you.
and I'm looking forward to see what is the, the outcome of it. Wow. So uh, thank you so much, Felipe. Thanks so much, Patrick. Um, so yeah, there you go. You can have your cake and eat it too, as Patrick said at the beginning. You can have better yields. You can have better business solution, more carbon capture, more biodiversity. Um, and that's an, and it's extremely exciting and inspiring. Um, so thank you so much to you both for the stories that you've shared during our time together. And thank you, the audience. Thank you so much for the questions you've asked and the comments you've posted. Um, we really hope to see you again over the next four days. A couple of sessions just to highlight to you tomorrow. Um, we've got a session at 10 o'clock that's looking at reuse. So three stories of reuse entrepreneurs from Southeast Asia um, tackling solutions to the plastic crisis. And at one o'clock, we talked a little bit already today about how we think shapes the world around us and our ways of thinking are informed by our learning. Um, at one o'clock, we've got a session on um, how learning shapes the transition to the circle economy. Thank you so much again to Patrick and Felipe. Thank you to our audience and we hope to see you again on the diff.